President Peter, fellow members and guests, it is my pleasure to introduce David Seymour, a leader of the ACT Party. Um, David grew up in Whangarei with his parents and two younger brothers. <clears throat> As a teenager, he moved to Auckland for high school and before graduating from the University of, Elect University of Auckland <clears throat> with a degree in electrical engineering and philosophy. At this time, David became involved in ACT by way of ACT on campus, and he stood for ACT in Mount Albert against Helen Clark in 2005. <coughs> he didn't win. Um, after starting work as an engineer, <coughs> the phone call had David getting on a plane and flying off to Canada, where he worked as a policy analyst for the Frontier Centre for Public Policy. When David returned to New Zealand in 2011, he advised John Banks on the initial policy development of partnership schools. But, wasn't, but it wasn't long before another call triggered a return to Canada where he worked for the, with the Reform Party founder, Preston Manning. David returned to New Zealand in 2013 and found himself campaigning in the Epsom electorate for ACT, which he won, and since then he has been working towards re-establishing the party. <coughs> While in Parliament, he has been a member of the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee, and amongst other things, has been appointed the Under Secretary to the Ministers of Education and Regulatory Reform. In 2015, he refused a ministerial appointment in order to be eligible to promote his private members' end of life choice bill, which has now been drawn from the ballot and is likely to be dated, debated later in the year. Just before I hand over to David, given the questions I've received about the title of today's speech, I feel it needs some interpretation. I didn't quite know myself, and I didn't get around to asking David, because Francis Weavers worked it out at drinks on Friday night. Um, as it happens, Lee is an acronym for Like It's Worth It, which happens to be the working title for David's book, which is due for release later this month. I am confident, however, that you'll find his speech less abstruse than the title. Over to you, David. Right, well, thank you very much, and I'll try and pack as uh, much as I can into the, the 10 minutes or so that we've now got. Um, I am someone who's had a long association with Rotary. Um, my grandfather was a Rotarian. Uh, they had a couple of exchange students, and it became a big part of their lives, travelling backwards and forwards to North America for several weddings. One of them got divorced and married again, so they got another trip out of that. Um, my grandfather resigned when women were admitted to the club, I can assure you. I can assure you that, I can assure you that that's more um, nurture than nature, uh, and not a genetic predisposition. Um, and uh, my mum was one of the last people in the Western world to contract the polio virus. Um, and so every time I speak to a Rotary Club, and I think this is about the fifth one I've done in the last 10 days, uh, I always make the point of thanking you for what you've done to eradicate that particular disease from the earth. And as I understand it, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, you've succeeded to the point that you have almost done it and in a few years will have done it. I think there's been a couple of cases in Bangladesh and, and Pakistan in the last few years, uh, and that's it, gone. And what an outstanding achievement. Um, like most people, I was heavily influenced by my mum, who was someone who, in spite of polio, uh, and in spite of being told that she would never drive, go to university, work, or have children, uh, overcame all of those barriers to differing extents. Uh, she became the chief pharmacist for the Northland DHB, having graduated Masters at Otago. Uh, the children are variable, my brothers are quite successful. Um, and um, I have to maintain that they were at least half right about her driving. Um, but, but nevertheless, it's a story about how um, life and what happens to you isn't like bad weather. Uh, you can actually make a difference in your own life. And my grandfather, who was a Rotarian, was another large, until they let the woman in, but um, was another large uh, influencer. And he was someone who built up what at one point and may still be was the largest privately held electrical contracting firm in New Zealand. 
Uh, and electrical contracting is tough because you come in at the end of the job when most of the screw-ups have already happened. Often you're doing the job to pay for the last one. You may, in the early stages of the company, be using the equity in your house as working capital. And then things go wrong, employees let you down, bar diggers fall off barges in the Pacific Islands, someone puts the wrong diesel in and it all falls apart, uh, and you pick yourself up and keep going. So those are some of my formative influences that have made me the person I am today and why I stand before you for ACT, because we are the only party remaining, I might add, or I might venture, that believes in free enterprise, personal responsibility, and the simple idea that people can make a difference in their own lives. And so the title of my talk, which is also the title of my book, uh, is that as politicians we should be making policy like it's worth it. And I could give you a lot of examples, but I want to give you just one, that I have some executive responsibility for government, and that's charter schools. And before you go making policy, it's critical to define the problem correctly, because otherwise you can never quite work out what you're doing. And the problem is simply this. Every year in New Zealand, taxpayers spend about 12 billion, 12.3 I think in the last year, $12.3 billion educating about 800,000 kids, give or take. In other words, $15,000 of economic resource per kid. And over 12 years, which you'd expect they'd be enrolled if not attending, that's 180 grand. Roughly enough to buy a three-bedroom villa in Mount Eden in 1947. <laughs> I'll which is another topic I won't talk about today, but I think it's a critical one for this election. And yet we hear that between 18 and 24, there's 360,000 kids, because there's about 60,000 kids a year born fairly consistently, and 90,000 of them are needs, not in education, employment or training. And if you think about this, it's, it's really quite amazing how badly we've managed to screw up education that we spend 180 grand on each kid, more economic resource than any society has ever been able to dream of putting into preparing its kids for the future. And yet we manage one time out of four to leave them unprepared for the 21st century. And I think that's a tragedy and I think that feeds a lot of what your president, Mr Lawson, was just saying to me, that even though statistically there's been no change in income inequality for the last 30 years, according to the Household Labour Force survey, there is a pervasive sense that more and more people somehow can't fully participate in the New Zealand that we all imagine we have or at least aspire to, to have, where Jack's as good as his master and anybody can make a go of it. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I unashamedly are an, am an advocate for partnership schools, Kuta Horua, the official policy name for charter schools. And aside from the fact that I, I kind of have to be, uh, it's also because I've visited all of them and they're some of the most impressive places with some of the most dynamic individuals that you'll ever meet. Not to say that we don't have great people throughout our state system, we do, but these people have a special sense of mission and purpose for those kids that I haven't seen anywhere else. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Raywin Tippane up in Whangarei, where I happen to grow up, observed that 86% of Māori boys in that city were failing NCEA Level 2. Now, for the older people in the room, NCEA Level 2 is a little bit like school certificate minus another 15 years of dumbing down. If you can't get that in the 21st century, you are stuffed, absolutely stuffed. And that's what we were doing to Māori boys in Whangarei, 86% failure rate. And Raywin has set up a school, and I'd love to say it all works perfectly for rhetorical reasons, but a bit over 86% of Maori boys are now passing at that school. That's the transition that you can create if you give people 
the option to enter the marketplace rather than having a closed shop, because we wouldn't advocate a closed shop in any other sector of society, let alone this one. That's what you get when you give people autonomy and we say, we're going to give you a check per kid, how you use it is up to you. And by the way, you're outside the State Sector Act, so you are not bound by the usual collective agreements that make it so difficult to reward the good and get rid of the bad like any other sector of the economy would do. And that's what happens when you give these kids the opportunity to go to a place that understands them on their terms. And I know a bit about Whangarei because some of my relatives have chaired boards of trustees and been quite deeply involved in the education of the place. And I can tell you that the kids at this school are almost all Maori kids, and they are so angry that they have been told by their teachers at other schools in the city that they're not going to succeed because they're Maori, sometimes subtly, sometimes not subtly. And when the Board of Trustees makes a complaint and says, this is not on, we've got to get rid of them, the teacher brings in the union, the principal shits themselves, apologies, but that's what happens, and the teacher goes on teaching and dispiriting these kids and ruining these, their lives. We have transformed that situation, and that's why the teacher unions have used everything in their power be it legal challenges under the Health and Safety Act, blackballing young teachers trying to get work experience, refusing to play sport with these kids on Saturday, for Christ's sake, in order to stop this transformation from happening. So that is of all the things uh, that I've done. It's not euthanasia. It's not keeping the pubs open for the Rugby World Cup, although that was pretty cool. Uh, of all the things I've done, it is transforming and shaking up education with some tiny little cracks, 12 small schools, cracks in the Berlin Wall, that will give every kid an opportunity to succeed on their own terms and navigate the 21st century with the skills required. And so, given the opportunity and the power at the next election, uh, the first thing I'll be doing is supercharging this policy. We've had some challenges, and our opponents have been quick to jump on those. Uh, but we now have most of the moving parts, oh God, I'm starting to sound like a Wellington person, but the, the moving parts are moving well in sync, uh, and the policy is fundamentally working for those kids, uh, and so we'll expand it. I'd love to give you a few more thoughts uh, about the housing market in particular, because that's the other pervasive reason why we have this inequality perception even, that doesn't quite show up in the statistics. Uh, I'd love to talk a little bit more about what we'd propose to uh, reward prisoners for learning to read in prison. At the moment, you've got people at the gate who want to volunteer to teach them, prisoners who want to learn to read so they can get a driver's license and a bank account and apply for a job like everybody else. Uh, and at the moment, there's too much bureaucracy to get those two to meet. Uh, we'd introduce a simple incentive for the prisoners, the tutors, corrections department and society that if you go in illiterate and if you learn to read in prison, we'll give you six weeks a year um, off your sentence. And I'd love to talk about how when I saw Zelandia, I thought what Ray Kroc said when he first met the McDonald's brothers, there ought to be one of these in every town. And we would set up sanctuary trusts, we'd privatise a few things to pay for it because we love privatising stuff. Um, and, um, well, it's true, and, uh, and, and set up a trust with a 100-year mission to contract charter-like organisations to set up more Zelandias, because the thing is, they're a great idea, but they always run out of money, as Zelandia did at one point, and I think, even I think it's the role of government to help bring back the bird song that, uh, I always forget this guy's name, Joseph Banks heard, when he was writing journals on Captain Cook's endeavour in 1769. We should be able to hear that again. It's coming back in Zealandia, but it should be everywhere. And you can imagine uh, the lovely people of Remuera trundling up Mount Eden uh, to bash a few rats, plant a few trees, and bring back uh, that halo effect of birdsong uh, across Remuera and central Auckland. Uh, but why couldn't you also uh, do it in Hamilton, in Whangarei, uh, 
who knows? I mean, maybe they could even do it in Christchurch. Um, you know, it's possible, and it's something that we should be aiming to do. So I'll wrap it up there um, and take a couple of questions if there's still time. Uh, but I'm very grateful to address uh, another Rotary Club, especially with uh, so many luminaries in the crowd. I've seen at least two people that are in the Ian Fraser documentary, Revolution. Um, there's Suzanne there. Um, and uh, if anyone's got anything else I could hold forth on. Oh, and can I just say one thing? I want to thank Michaela for inveigling me in here. And um, whoever let her introduce and give me the vote of thanks, it's sort of sort of like the Springboks, you know, bringing your own referee. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but she has been a, a fantastic vice president for our party and uh, very grateful for, for all of Michaela's support both here um, and as we go towards the election. Thank you very much.